brother, can you spare a dime? Economics as we know it arose from managing poverty and as a subject matter has been rather slow to recognize the difference made by excessive wealth. In 1955, John Kenneth Galbraith was awarded a grant from the Guggenheim Foundation to study poverty. He found wealth creation and its self-preservation way easier to study. Rich and poor alike, everyone wants the silver spoon. The poor and what you're going to do to support the poor. Here is a brief overview of Galbraith's somewhat subjective work on what drives value, generates wealth, and makes a society rich. For starters, the structure of an affluent society is one where the wealthy understand and leverage society far better than the poor and have a vested interest in protecting their understanding of certain social dynamics. Newsflash. Inequality is great and only getting greater. Analysis shows the lowest income bracket will benefit the least. Galbraith blames psychological bias for poverty, saying how individuals associate truth with convenience by avoiding awkward efforts. He claims the underprivileged seek satisfaction in knowing that more famous or credible people share their conclusions. Even to some of my hardcore fans. You can punch me in the face 8,000 times. Mm-hmm, would love to. Now, how many actual millionaires listen to that? The example of an affluent society in the book is early 20th century USA. But even today, think of the relatively low occurrence of extreme wealth demonstration in the US. Yourself are worth nine or ten billion dollars today. What's with the Honda? <laughs> this is a perfectly good car. <laughs> all in all, the affluent society captures the zeitgeist of post-World War II Western economics through a summary on how the economic machine evolved over time. The book goes over the Great Depression, as well as a critique on Marx, Ricardo, and Malthus. Since the book was originally published in 1958, aka the glory days of communism, Galbraith objects that socialism destroys ambition, discourages investment to create new jobs, and may well turn a nation of risk-taking entrepreneurs into a nation of wimps. Today's affluent society is one where luxuries overtook necessities through consumer demand. Once upon a time, more production meant more houses for the homeless, more food for the hungry, and more clothing for the cold. But instead, more production gave rise to a craving for more elegant cars, more exotic food, and more erotic clothing. Truth is, the world already has a working solution for most pressing survival issues as it is. So to create demand for new gadgets, companies need to come up with elaborate and functional changes each year, jam-packed with great new capabilities, and then subject the consumers to ruthless psychological pressure to persuade them of their importance. With the proliferation of consumerism, income and employment have become our basic economic concern. Recessions raise fears of unemployment rather than lost output. Indeed, when people are unemployed, society does not miss the goods they do not produce. Jobs, jobs, good paying jobs. But the unemployed do miss the income they no longer earn. And when the majority is employed, affluence becomes scalable. One of the oldest and most effective tricks up the affluent sleeve is to assert that all work, physical, mental, artistic, or managerial, is essentially the same. American CEOs are pleased to think that the executive office is the same as the assembly line, and it is the greater demand in talent that justifies their paychecks. In other parts of the world too, the communist administrator considers his labor the same as the comrade out on the farm, with whom they share a common ideology. A half century later, and production continues to measure the quality and progress of the developed world. So here's Galbraith's template on how to increase production. Eliminate idleness of labor and capital. Distribute labor and capital between the production of various things and services. Increase the supply of labor. Increase the supply of capital, which could also serve as a substitute for labor. And finally, given constant supply of labor and capital, technological innovation will increase output and its quality on its own. Some more of Galbraith's 20th century idealism is his call to attack monopolies, lower tariffs, and promote competition and the free movement of labor and capital. And as for you, if you are not greedy, why seek pay raises? 
Well, in an affluent society, pay is a prime index of prestige. Think of it as a measure of personal output or quantifiable contribution. Despite the flaws, facades, and complicated social dynamics, affluence enables higher order productivity in our civilization. However, for the affluent society to sustain growth, elimination of poverty must be placed front and center on the social and political agenda.